this pilot is about to fire at a target on a beach in West Wales. We carry one gun, it fires 1,200 rounds a minute. Dave McBride is the first of the pilots we've been following to make it to the final stages of training at RAF Valley. This is the most demanding phase of the course. When you come onto the range, you flick your switch guard up to the dangerous position from the safe position. Dave has seen combat before as an RAF navigator. As a pilot, he'll be firing the weapons himself. The bomb itself is a three kilogram bomb. It's apprehensive, yeah, just because it's, it's still fear of failure, you know, you, you never know the course, the learning curve on the course is massively steep here. Mark Baker has been sent from Morea Valley to Canada for the final stages of his training. Go up and do an exercise uh, with an instructor and then next trip you're up doing it yourself. Pilots and aircraft from all over Britain gather on Anglesey to take part. The star of the show was the F-15 Strike Eagle, the state-of-the-art American fighter bomber. As aeroplanes go, that is sex. I think most people would agree. What would you do if you had one of those? One of those, we'd kick, we'd kick everybody's ass. That would be it. Yeah, no doubt about it whatsoever. You can't get away from it. They've got really good aeroplanes. But we are better than them. Yes, they have some very good guys, but our training is still the best. And we are bloody good. And you put a good crew together in this and they can go out and do a damn good job with it. This is the British fighter, the Tornado F3. Dave McBride spent 18 years as a navigator in this aircraft. He wants to rejoin his colleagues as a pilot. He's nearly there, but the most gruelling part of the course is still to come. And he knows success is by no means guaranteed. You are taking our young pilots close to the point of mental saturation. An awful lot of people get out of the aircraft having been flying for 30 or 40 minutes and they are dripping with sweat. It is not just the physical effort, it is the mental strain that goes with that exercise. You're asking a question. Dave is about to undertake a weapons exercise in Valley's multi-million pound simulator. It's the thing of being assessed the whole time. If you imagine how you felt when you did your driving test, how nervous the average person feels, well, put that to every trip, and that's how it feels. The virtual runway is that of RAF St. Athan in the Vale of Glamorgan. The route takes him west over Aberthaw Power Station. Dave's destination is the bombing range at Pembrey in Carmarthenshire. Oh, no, Dave has to hit the target from a low level. He has to show that he can cope with the complex thinking involved in such a mission before he does it with real ammunition. Dave gets points for every hit, but that isn't enough. He has to be consistent in his technique. The RAF invests a lot of time and money in these pilots. Training costs millions. A frontline jet, over 30 million. They need good results in return. Dave has had a few good hits, but needs more work on his technique. Next time it will be for real. The pressure is on. So as you can see, I'm sweating. 
<laughs> Not easy. Oh dear. Force Base in Canada. Mark Baker is joined here by fellow pilot Leah Hearn for the final part of their combat training, because Valley can't meet the RAF's increasing demand for fast jet pilots. It's a NATO Air Force Base. Here, Mark and Lee will use the most up-to-date weaponry and rub shoulders with frontline pilots from all over the world, some fresh from active service. I get to work with uh, other nationalities um, that, of course, we, we will be working with uh, throughout NATO, throughout our careers. Different sort of nationalities have different sort of ways of doing things, and you can pick up uh, different, slightly different mindsets, probably about flying certain things. We've got some Swedish, we've got some German, some Finnish, um, Hungarians. It's, uh, it's really quite a mix. The flying has got to be the best thing about Canada, simply in terms of the aircraft that we've got to fly and the airspace that we've got to fly it in. If you were to take the whole training area and overlay it over Europe, it fills up something like uh, three quarters of the size of Europe. The amount of airspace is absolutely extraordinary. The course is very similar to the one at RAF Valley, but they use a much more modern Hawk jet and the latest technology used on the front line. OK, this is the uh, cockpit of the 155. most obvious difference to the T1 is the head-up display, which is right in front of the pilot's field of view. The head-up display unit replaces all the customary cockpit meters and dials with one fully integrated screen. And it means that you can have all the information in front of you so you're looking through it, so you don't have to keep glancing down at the cockpit. Five, ten. It allows you to keep a lot more eyes out of the, uh, of the aircraft. Uh, looking, looking for other aircraft fighting. 25, 30. Aircraft in the front line all have head up displays, multi function displays, and the kind of electronics that this Hawk has. So. Lee is preparing for a training sortie in the Hawk. His instructor is Danish. The mission low level flying. The RAF are world renowned for their uh, low level flying, and if there's a job generally to do at low level, we'll, uh, we'll do it. And we can do it because we train for it, and historically we've got the experience of doing it. Um, so, low level particularly is, is, is what I enjoy. Um, you know, legalised hooliganism, really, best kept secret uh, 420 knots at 250 feet and uh, bombing targets. It's brilliant. flying at low level just for the fun of it. This is an exercise in evading an incoming missile, or spike. Spike. One o'clock. Lee shifts the aircraft 90 degrees to maximize his speed away from the incoming missile. Sharp flare. He then makes a sharp ascent, twists, and then plummets down towards the ground. Flat. If he does it fast enough, then the missile should be speeding away elsewhere. Spike two o'clock. Yeah. 
Oh, that? oh, excellent. Awesome fun. Really, really good. Uh, lovely afternoon. Jet, everything worked. It was uh, really beautiful. Back in Britain, the pilots of 19 Squadron have moved down to RAF St. Athan in South Wales. The Hawks are being prepared for a mission to the bombing ranges of Pembrey. This is Dave's first flight with live ammunition. They're flying at seven miles per minute. If they literally make a major mistake, it could have fatal consequences in seconds. That alone is going to focus your attention. Hey, Tab. Hey. You've got the pressure of the fact that you're hurting around uh, in this fantastic little sports car of a Hawk, um, and, and now with weapons on as well. So the last thing you want to do is uh, make a mess of something, switches in the wrong position and, and have a, you know, a bomb come off the aeroplane in the wrong place. Uh, so put all that together with the fact you are being assessed the whole time and the fact that if you fail a trip, you're then on to the, uh, the start of the slippery slope. Close to the target is the control tower. Staff here ensure that all civilians and livestock are at a safe distance from the danger zone. They also monitor the pilot's accuracy. The demands are high. First Dave is shooting bullets. The gun sight he's using is a small inverted T in the upper third of the screen. He has to come out of a sharp turn at just the right moment. Then he needs to line the plane with the target, all at a speed of 400 miles per hour. is even more demanding. Where the bomb lands depends not only on the speed and direction of the aircraft, but also the speed and direction of the wind. 729 in hot. 720 right hand panel, surface wind at 12 o'clock, 6 weeks. Dave has to do some rapid mental arithmetic and adjust his bomb sight as he approaches the bombing range. It's split-second timing. At these speeds, half a second can make a difference of 60 feet or more on the ground. Given all he has to think about, his passes are remarkably accurate. Can 
Every mission is a test and day's performance is assessed. Every element of the sortie is recorded and can now be minutely analysed. Good technique. Let's see how your pick conditions are working out. Oh, first of it was nice, good heights and everything. Questions for me? No, that was nice, thank you. Right, well, let's gonna look at the weather for the next one. Yeah. Let me just... He's passed the test, but he can't afford to get complacent. He could still fail the course. There we go, all over. That was good. That came out as a nice trip. So uh Satisfied. Good mark, good score on the doors. Bombs are not too long, which is uh, good. So I'm going to head off and see uh, what the weather's like for the solo. At the NATO base in Canada, Mark and Lee have been paired together for training. They will live together, fly together, study together, and eventually fight together. When we're working together, we've, we've got to rely on each other and, and make sure that if, um, if he, he, for example, if we're just doing 2v1 engagements, if he engages the bandit and I go away to get some separation, um, He's got to trust me that I'm actually going to come back and uh, tell him, right, come off the bandit now and I will kill him for you. Um, and when we actually get into a real wartime scenario, you've got to have supreme, supreme trust in the person that you're with um, that they will actually do that. Affirmative. And now. And shoot everyone has sight on, run when able. Great, great, great. Bandit, you're six o'clock, one mile. Come on, Tony. Obviously, I want to get to the front line. I want to get to a, uh, a combat aircraft, and I want to be part of the elite. Please. If, at some point, I am called to go to war, of course, I will go. One. But I, I'm not looking forward to it, and I don't relish it. It is what we train for. Uh, you try and think about it all you, you can. You, you, know, you think what, if, what ifs, what ifs. I think it's virtually impossible to say before you're actually in that situation how you're going to feel you know, at the exact moment when you're up in the air and dropping whatever on, onto your know, targets. When I was a little boy, I used to see the jets flying down the valley. And, uh, you know, I used to look up and say, look, Mum, I'm, you know, Nan, I'm going to fly one of those one day. And they were like, oh, of course you are. And 20 years later, I actually did that. Massive sense of achievement. And Shooter 1 is offensive. Shooter 2, tally visual. Shooters, hard left, bonded by 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 miles. We don't undertake this lightly. Uh, we don't go into it without thinking about it. Um, but... Uh, you know, there are good times to be had, the flying's great, um, and it's, it's something that will never happen to me, so they say. At RAF St. Athen, they service the Tornado F3. Oh, I've flown that one yeah. Yeah. Five, yeah. Five, five, nine, yeah. Dave was a navigator in this very aircraft. It took him to the front line where he saw the harsh realities of war. It brings back lots of memories. He has a history with this plane. It's a fighter, and all I ever wanted to do for being a little boy was be a fighter pilot. 
hopefully that's where I'll be, in that front cockpit, flying the aeroplane roughly the start of next year, January, February next year, uh, which would be nice. And instead of sitting up there in the back cockpit, hidden down in the workshop at the back there, I'll be in the front, at the business end, doing the stuff, listening to what the guy's saying in the back, doing as he's asking and fighting the aeroplane. Looking at the back seat there, Dave, does it bring back memories for you? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, 1,700 hours, Lo lots of memories in there. I flew in the original Gulf War uh, right at the start and uh, flown over Bosnia, policed Bosnia, two, two sessions, and obviously lots of stints down the Falklands as well. Um, so, yeah, lots of good memories and uh, lots of bad memories as well. I've, I've had friends killed in the aeroplane. Um, so, you know, being stood next to it again it makes you think, because it is a serious business. Yeah, lots of memories, good and bad. Lots. Dave is nearing the end of his training. This is his final sortie as a trainee at RAF Valley. The last time he'll fly a hawk over Wales. It's almost a year to the day since Dave first sat in the cockpit of a Hawk jet. Now he's to find out how well he's done and whether he can return to the front line as a pilot. The powers that be are meeting to make that crucial decision. OK, welcome uh, to the uh, role disposal of TW11 course. They're a bit of a mixed bag of, bag of uh, age and experience, uh, and at the moment they're as frag minus one. Two feet red. Senior third, officers at Valley link up with RAF HQ in Gloucester to discuss the pilot's future. You can see that he started off average to high average, and pretty much throughout his airmanship and his captaincy have been uh, nice. His scores are generally pretty good, although uh, he tends to lack the smoothness that uh, he could have. But uh, the comment from the staff guys who have flown the later SAPs and the op sorties have been that he appears to be uh, getting capacity limited in the, uh, the OS role um, as the workload's increased, uh, characterised by some erratic uh, MSD and uh, a couple of iffy calls on the nav. <laughs> Dave and the other pilots are in the officers' mess, awaiting their fate. Very nervous, very nervous. Uh, what we're about to see is potentially life-changing situation, you know, whatever aircraft we end up on. You know, everybody's just been looking more and more grey and ashen as the day's gone on, waiting for this. And in a whatever, an hour, an hour and a half's time, we're going to know where we're going. It would be too easy to merely tell the pilots which aircraft they'll fly. Instead, they face a bizarre ritual involving the Wheel of Fortune, a football and a lot of alcohol. A Harrier, not Dave's choice of aircraft. But before he's told his destiny, he must score a goal. And for every wrong aeroplane, there's a shot of alcohol. Spot. That's a drink. Oh. 
He's landed here before. Another hot spot means another drink. One pilot after another is put out of his misery. Dave is the last to find out. He finally lands on his beloved Tornado F3. This is the aircraft he desperately wants to fly. This is the moment that decides his future. But first, he has to score a goal. Eighteen years of determination and self-belief. A gruelling 12 months at Valley, but navigator Dave McBride is now a combat pilot. Dave McBride has been extremely successful and achieved all we could have hoped for and more. Has done really well and uh, has set himself up really nicely for a future career um, as, a, as a pilot in the Air Force. Bring it on! Dave leaves Wales to fly the Tornado F3. Fresh-faced youth that walk through the door, they have truly assumed the mantle that we wanted them to on day one. Mark Baker has excelled in Canada. He goes on to fly the RAF's most demanding aircraft, the Harrier. Welshman Lee Ahern was selected to fly the Tornado GR4. Rich Forks didn't make it through the course. He's now flying RAF transport aircraft. Lewis Cunningham was nearly chopped because of air sickness. But he's since succeeded. He too gets to fly the Harrier. The pilots have experienced hardship, frustration, tension and elation. They leave, but the work continues at Valley. Training ordinary people to do extraordinary things. The pilots came as rookies. They leave as combat pilots. There's a chance to win a VIP day out at RAF Valley on Anglesey for yourself and three friends. Just log on to bbc.co.uk slash combat pilot.